ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد سترابر عند حديث ابو هريره رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الاخر فليقل خيرا او ليصمت ومن كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الاخر فليكرم ضيفه رواه البخاري ومسلم In this hadith Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu states that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Whomsoever believes in Allah on the last day then let him say goodness let him speak with goodness or remain silent either speak good or remain silent wa man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawm al akhir and whomsoever believes in Allah on the last day fal yukrim dayfa then let him honor his guest so whomsoever believes in Allah on the last day then speak goodness or remain silent and whomsoever believes in Allah on the last day then honor your guests a shaykh al fawzan hafizahullah ta'ala says regarding this hadith which is in al bukhari and muslim hadha al hadith fihi bayan ba'd khisal al iman this hadith within it is a clarification of some of the characteristics of iman some of the types of traits or characteristics that a person should have a person of iman لان الايمان له خصال وله شعب كثيرة because iman has various characteristics that go with it various different types of characteristics that go with iman and it has different branches to iman وكل اعمال الخير وكل الطاعات والقربات كلها من الايمان and all of the actions of righteousness all of the actions of righteousness and all of the obediences and all of those actions that you seek closeness to Allah with those acts of obedience based upon sincerity and following the sunnah then all of those are from iman all of those types of behaviors are from iman لان الايمان because iman it is qawlun bil lisan the statement of the tongue wa i'tiqadun bil qalb and the belief in the heart wa amalun bil jawarih and the action of the limbs this is the definition of al iman the understanding of al iman that it is belief in the heart statements of the tongue and actions of the limbs and that is an easy definition in that format to remember even if there are other definitions that the salaf they used to mention this is the popular definition that many of the scholars they use now it is easy to understand and to learn that iman is belief in the heart statements of the tongue and actions of the limbs fal a'mal sawa'an kanat min a'mal al qulub so the actions whether they are actions of the heart there are certain types of behaviors and actions they are actions of the heart kal khawfi wal khashya wal raghba wal rahba for example fear fear is something which occurs from the heart and this can also be an act of worship there is some fear which is natural fear natural fear a person goes to some place a forest and there's predatory animals in there you're going to have a natural fear that is one thing but then there is the fear which comes with it subservience to Allah humility before Allah and that is an act of worship that you do not fear others besides Allah with that type of fear you do not allow others to prevent you in your practicing of the religion fearing them over and above allah that is incorrect 
So fearing Allah in that way, it is an act of worship. Just as we know, all worship is built upon or rather revolves around those three aspects of love, fear and hope. So fear is an act of worship and that comes from the heart. Similarly, min a'mal al-jawarih, from the actions of the limbs. And there are several examples the Shaykh mentions, as-salah, prayer, as-sayam, fasting, al-hajj, as-sadaqa, charity, wa ghayri dhalik, and other than that. These are physical actions that you do with your limbs. Those physical actions with your limbs are also a part of iman. كُلُّهَا مِنْ حَقِيقَةِ الْإِيمَانِ دَاخِلَةٌ فِيهِ So all of this, the belief in the heart, the actions of the heart, the obediences that you carry out with your heart, like fear, love, hope, and also the statements of the tongue, the remembrance and the dhikr that you do upon your tongues, and also the actions upon your limbs, the physical actions, all of that is from the reality of iman, all of that is from the essence of Iman. وَفِي هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ بَيَانُ شَيْءٍ مِنْهَا So in this hadith now, we are going to be taught some of those characteristics that are from Iman. Some of those behaviors that are from Iman. So firstly, the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, قَوْلُهُ مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Whomsoever believes in Allah and the last day. Whomsoever believes in Allah and the last day. Here a Shaykh Al-Fawzan says, Al-Aslu huwa al-Imanu billahi azza wa jal. The foundation, the basis is the Iman in Allah. That is the core, that is what the other aspects all return back to. So when Jibreel alayhi salam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, as we covered in the hadith, أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِيمَانِ Tell me about Iman. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam said, أَن تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَأَن تُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ That you believe in Allah. That was the first. Then in the angels, in the prophets, in the books, in the last day, and in the decree. Those other five, they all return back to the belief in Allah. The belief in Allah is the basis and the core. Wal yawmil akhir. And belief in the last day. Alladhi huwa al-ba'athu wa al-nushur yawm al-qiyamah. And that is the resurrection on the day of judgment. The day of judgment, wal yawm al-akhir. The final day, that is the day of resurrection. The Day of Judgment. لِأَنَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِالْبَعْثِ فَإِنَّهُ يَسْتَعِدُّ لَهُ Because somebody who believes in that last day, somebody who believes that that last day will occur and it will come, then that type of person who has the yaqeen, the certainty and the belief that the last day is coming, he will prepare for it. He will then ready himself for that day and prepare himself for that day. وَمُجَرَّدُ الْإِيمَانِ بِالْبَعْثِ دُونَ الْإِسْتِعْدَادِ لَهُ لَا يُفِيدُ شَيْئًا However, simply believing that the day of judgment is real and it will occur without preparing for it, then that doesn't benefit you. That isn't the beneficial factor here. The benefit here is that you know the day of judgment is going to occur and you prepare for it. Not that you just know that it's going to occur and believe in it, but do nothing to prepare for it. How do you prepare for it? With the good deeds and the obediences and the worship to Allah. That is preparation for the day of judgment. And that is why the scholars have said, this is the reason why, or one of the reasons why, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not tell us when the day of judgment is going to be. Just like in the hadith of Jibreel, when Jibreel alayhi salam said, tell me about the hour, akhbirni ani sa'a. When is the day of judgment? And what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Mal masulu anha bi a'lama min sail That the one who is being asked the question is no more knowledgeable than the one who is asking. I, the Prophet ﷺ, do not know, and you, Jibreel ﷺ, do not know. 
We are not aware of when that hour is going to occur. And some of the scholars have said the reason for that being so that the people, they continuously prepare for it. Because if you knew when it was going to be exactly, if everybody knew the Day of Judgment was going to be at this particular date exactly, then people would become lazy. And they wouldn't bother doing anything until that time got close. And when it started to get really close, they'd start doing all of their worship. So this way, the people don't know when the Day of Judgment is. So they are continuously, always preparing in worship and obedience. And that's why some of the Salaf, they used to say, if the angel of death came today, then there would be nothing extra that I would be able to do. Meaning that they would fill their days in worship. They would fill their days in worship. And perhaps we mentioned the example of Masruq. It's mentioned that when he made Hajj, Hajj is only five or six days long. During the nights, he would go to sleep in a state of prostration because he wanted to be sleeping in a position which was an act of worship. Typically, prostrating is an act of worship. So this is how they would use every minute of their time in that worship, preparing for the Day of Judgment. So, the shaykh says, a person who believes in the Day of Judgment but doesn't prepare for it, then that will not benefit. And that's why there is a narration when a person came to the Prophet ﷺ, and he said to the Prophet ﷺ, when is the Day of Judgment? Mata sa'ah. A person came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked, when is the hour? When is the Day of Judgment? What did the Prophet ﷺ say back to him? The Prophet ﷺ didn't tell him when it is. The Prophet ﷺ doesn't know. We don't know. We don't know when the Day of Judgment is. The Prophet ﷺ replied back and said to him, "Mada a'adat talaha? What have you prepared for it? Meaning, it's not really the point when is it going to be. The point is, you need to be preparing for it whenever it is. Whenever the Day of Judgment comes, you need to be ready for it. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, what have you prepared for it? Irrelevant of when it's going to be. Whenever it comes, the point is, what have you done in preparation for that day? So this is what the Prophet ﷺ told that man. He said to him, you need to be preparing. That was the point. Um, بَلْ لَا بُدَّ أَنْ يَسْتَعِدَّ الْعَبْدُ لِلْبَعَثِ فَيُكْثِرُ مِنَ الْحَسَنَاتِ وَيَتُوبُ عَنِ سَيِّئَاتِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَمُوتَ وَيُبْعَثِ So a person must prepare... He must prepare for that day and to increase in his good deeds and to repent from the evil deeds uh, in preparation for that day before he dies and before the resurrection occurs. This is the reason why in this hadith it mentions whomsoever believes in Allah, which is the basis, and in the day of judgment. And it doesn't mention the angels or the prophets or the books or the decree. It just mentions belief in Allah and the day of judgment. Belief in Allah because that's the basis. Belief in the day of judgment because somebody who has that firmly with certainty will mean that they are preparing for it. And therefore they will be able to accept these characteristics of iman and implement them. وَإِلَّا فَأَرْكَانُ الْإِيمَانِ سِتَّةَ كَمَا هُوَ مَعْلُومٌ وَآخِرُهَا الْإِيمَانُ بِالْبَعَثِ وَلَكِنَّهُ ذَكَرَهُ مَعَ الْإِيمَانِ بِاللَّهِ تَأْكِيدًا لَهُ وَلِأَنَّ الْإِنسَانَ إِذَا آمَنَ أَنَّهُ سَيُبْعَثُ وَيُحَاصَبُ وَيُجَازَى فَإِنَّهُ يَهْتَمُّ وَيَسْتَعِدْ وَيُقِيمُ بَقِيَّةَ أَرْكَانِ الْإِسْلَامِ وَغَيْرَهَا مِنَ الْوَاجِبَاتِ وَيَجْتَنِبُ الْمُحَرَّمَاتِ So if somebody knows that the day of judgment is going to occur he will prepare for that and no doubt from preparing for that he will therefore have the full iman in the other aspects too. If he is preparing for the day of judgment, then he will have iman in the books of Allah and the Quran and practice it and implement it. He will have iman in the messengers and prophets of Allah. He'll have iman in the angels of Allah. He'll have iman in the decree of Allah. He will have iman in the other aspects if he understands and realizes that he is preparing for the day of judgment. So then the hadith says, whomsoever believes in the day of judgment and uh, in Allah and the day of judgment, then فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَسْمُتْ Then let him either speak goodness or remain silent. فَإِنَّ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْإِسْتِعْغَادِ لَهُ أَنْ يَقُولَ الْعَبْدُ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَسْمُتْ أَوْ يَسْمُتْ Because indeed from Iman in Allah and the last day, 
and in terms of your preparation for that day, is this characteristic of either speaking goodness or if you have nothing good to say, remain silent. But not to use your tongues in incorrect and corrupt speech. That is a characteristic mentioned here. If you open the mouths to speak, then speak with goodness. Speak with that which is obedience to Allah. If you do not have that, or you have no goodness to say, then the hadith says, remain silent. Don't speak then for the sake of speaking with corrupt or evil speech. If you have nothing good to say, stay silent. If you have goodness to say, and obedience, then speak. فَقَدْ خَلَقَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ هَذَا اللِّسَانِ فِي هَذَا الْإِنسَانِ Because indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this tongue within the person. وَعَلَّمَهُ النُّطْقَ وَالْبَيَانِ نِعْمَةً مِنْهُ And Allah taught us how to speak, how to pronounce the words. And that is a blessing from Allah upon us. That we were given the tongue and then Allah taught us how to use this tongue and to speak and to pronounce the words. وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْهُ مِنَ الْجَوَامِدِ الَّتِي لَا تَنْطِقُ And Allah didn't make this tongue or this mouth something like an object that can't do anything. Rather it was made to be able to pronounce and to speak. Not to be in a manner where a person is dumb or deaf and blind. But rather these faculties were given to us with those blessings of being able to use them in that way. وَهَذَا اللِّسَانِ سِلَاحٌ ذُو حَدَّيْنَ And the shaykh says, this tongue, it is a weapon with two sides. It is a weapon that has two sides to it. A two-sided sword, a two-sided blade. It has two sides to it. Meaning, this particular tongue, إِنْ اِسْتَعْمَلْتَهُ فِي الْخَيْرِ جَنَا لَكَ خَيْرًا وَأَثْمَرَ لَكَ خَيْرًا if you use your tongue in goodness, then it will provide for you goodness. It will bring into fruition goodness. If you use the tongue for goodness. But, إِنْ اِسْتَعْمَلْتَهُ فِي الشَّرْ جَنَا عَلَيْكَ شَرًّا وَإِثْمَا وَذَلِكَ بِحَصَبِ مَا تَنْطِقُ بِهِ If you use the tongue in evil, then it will produce evil for you. If you use this tongue with evil speech, then that will end up producing evil for you. وَلِأَهْمِيَّةِ الْكَلَامِ And because of the importance of the speech, this speech that we have been given to be able to speak with, to utter the words with, the importance of that is such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given responsibility to two angels to record everything we say with this tongue. To record all of that speech that is said. وَكَّلَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَ مَلَكَيْنِ عَنْ يَمِينِ الْإِنسَانِ وَشِمَالِهِ مُلَازِمَيْنِ لَهُ يَكْتُبَانِ مَا يَقُولَ Two angels to the right and to the left, one to the right, one to the left, who are with him at all times and they record all of that which he does and says. As Allah mentioned in the Qur'an, مَا يَلْفِذُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ There is not a word that he says, إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ Except that there is upon him, the one who is monitoring him, the angels recording all of that which he does. So they write down everything, whether what you are saying is obedience, it is good, or if it is something evil, all of that will be written down and recorded. قال فليقل خيرًا. So the Prophet ﷺ said. If you're going to believe in, if you believe in Allah on the last day, then speak goodness. Just as Allah said in the Quran, وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا sadida, And say a speech which is upright, a speech which is correct and upright. Speak in that manner. وَالْكَلَامُ الْخَيْرِ And the good speech that is being mentioned here, if you believe in Allah on the last day, then speak with good speech, i.e. the remembrance and the supplication of Allah. The tasbih, the tahleel, the takbir, Allahu Akbar, subhanallah, la ilaha illallah. Tilawatul Qur'an, reciting the Qur'an. Other remembrance and dua, enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. Teaching people beneficial knowledge. Rectifying between people and correcting the wrongs that may have occurred between them. All of this type of speech, you use your tongue within it, then that is goodness in the speech. That is goodness within the speech. 
وَالْكَلَامُ لَا يُكَلِّفُ كَثِيرًا And to speak doesn't burden a person. There isn't burden in speaking. A person opens the mouth and the voice comes and a person speaks. There is no burden. It is not like lifting something heavy. It is with ease that a person is able to speak. فَهُوَ لَيْسَ مِثْلَ الصَّلَاةِ So it's not like the prayer where there is more burden to make the wudu and then to stand and to make the movements and to pray at those particular times or even fasting where there is more burden not to be able to eat all day wal al jihad the jihad clearly also more burden fa tastati'u an taqula khayran wa anta jalis the shaykh says the point being you can say goodness with your tongue and you're sitting down relaxing sitting down and relaxing and you can be obeying allah by doing goodness with your tongue with remembrance and dua and supplication la ilaha illallah subhanallah by doing the good speech with your tongue whilst you're sitting down relaxing. It doesn't take a burden. You may even be lying down, the shaykh says, muttaji'un. Maybe you're lying down and you're reciting something good. Or rakibun, maybe you're riding, you're in a car. You could be reciting what you're driving. Or mashin, or you're walking. فَالْبَدَنُ يَتَعَبُ مِنَ الطَّاعَ لَكِنَّ اللِّسَانَ لَا يَتَعَبُ مِنَ الْكَلَامِ Physically your bodies may become tired when worshipping. Person prays in the night prayer, after a lengthy night prayer, perhaps you become tired in your body. But the tongue, you could speak and speak and speak and the tongue would not become tired. It is not burdensome upon the tongue as it would be physically other acts of worship upon the body. So a person can use that to benefit himself, to use the tongue to amass the good deeds from remembrance and dua and supplication. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Awliyasmut. If you don't have that to say, then be quiet. Don't speak, be silent. إِذَا لَمْ يَقُلْ خَيْرًا فَإِنَّهُ يَسْمُتُ مِنْ أَجْلِ أَنْ يَسْلَمُ If you haven't got good to say, then stay silent and be quiet, so that you protect yourself from any danger. If you haven't got anything good to say, then stay silent. Because if you don't stay silent, and you haven't got anything good to say, and you start speaking, then you may well end up saying things which are incorrect and haram, and they get recorded as bad deeds for you. So to save yourself from that situation of having bad deeds recorded, stay silent in the first place. If you have nothing good to say, then just stay silent. Rather than speaking for the sake of speaking and ending up, saying things that get recorded on the bad deeds for yourself. فَإِذَا نَطَقَ فَإِن كَانَ خَيْرًا غَنِمَ وَإِن كَانَ شَرًا هَلَكَ Because if you speak, if you speak goodness, that will be reward. But if you end up speaking bad, that will destroy you. وَأَكْثَرُ مَا يَصْدُرُ مِنَ الْإِنسَانِ خُصُوصًا مَعَ الْغَفْلَةِ وَضَعْفِ الْإِيمَانِ كَلَامٌ سَيِّئِ And one of the most things that happens to a person, the shaykh says, is when you are in negligence, you're not really thinking about what you're doing, what you're saying, your iman may be weak. One of the greatest things that will happen is that a person begins to use his tongue incorrectly. Begins to speak about this person or backbite that person or lie about that person. Maybe his own situation is bad, so he blames other people and starts backbiting them. When you're weak in iman, or you're in a state of negligence, not upon worship properly and strongly, then often the people, they will find themselves in this, that they end up talking about things or saying things, that get recorded against them. And that is why the hadith mentions, وَإِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَا يَتَكَلَّمُ بِكَلِمَةٍ مِنْ سَخَةِ اللَّهِ لَا يُلْقِي لَهَا بَالًا يَهْمِي بِهَا إِلَى جَهَنَّمْ That maybe an individual, he speaks with an evil speech and he doesn't even think about it. Just some words that he says, they're evil. But he doesn't pay attention to it, he just says them. And then he forgets them. But they will be recorded down and on the day of judgment because of those few words he may end up in the hellfire. So a person must be careful with that. There is another hadith which says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَرِهَ لَكُمْ ثَلَاثًا There are three things that Allah dislikes for you. قِيلَ وَقَالْ The type of speech which is loose speech, he said this and he said that and I heard this and I heard that. All types of random speech without any authenticity to them. Stories and tales here and there. I heard this and I heard that. He said this to me and he said that to me. وَإِضَاعَةَ الْمَالِ And wasting money. وَكَثَرَةَ السُؤَالِ And asking excessively. These have been mentioned in a hadith. So the point being there, قِيلَ وَقَالْ Talking much. He said this and he said that and I heard them saying this and I heard them saying that. And these types of things are prohibited. We've already mentioned the hadith previously. مَرَّ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِقَبَرَيْنِ فَقَالْ إِنَّهُمَا لَيُعَذَّبَانِ The Prophet ﷺ, he walked past two graves and he said, these two are being punished. أَمَّا أَحَدُهُمَا فَكَانَا As for one of them, because he used to 
Yamshi bin Namima. He used to spread the stories between the people, the tales between the people. He said this about you, and he said that about you. And she said this, and she said that, and I heard this, and I heard that. For the purpose of causing corruption between the people. So that will be a punishment of the grave for that individual for this action of his. On the other one, كَانَ لَا يَسْتَنْزِهُ مِنَ الْبَوْلِ Nabi used to look after himself when urinating, and so the splashes, etc. would go everywhere. He wouldn't purify himself properly. That was also a punishment of the grave. So the Shaykh says, فَيُحْسِي أَقْوَالَ النَّاسِ وَيَنْشَغِلُ بِهَا وَالْكَلَامُ الشَّرْ مِثْلَ The evil type of speech is like al ghiba backbiting, and namima storytelling amongst the people, carrying tales, وَالشَّتْمُ abusing people, swearing at people, قَوْلِ zur the false testification, false testification, and this is what occurs from people too, when somebody has committed an error or a sin, and they know they have been exposed for that error or sin, they will find somebody from their relatives or friends, or somebody who will defend them falsely, they will come and they will testify, no I testify, this individual, he was with me on that day, he couldn't have done what you're accusing him of, and he lies with that testimony, so this is قَوْلُ zur the false testification, all types of false speech. Testification is from the head of those, from the, the, the most severe types of the false speech. But any type of false speech and lying comes into that too. وَشَهَادَةِ zuri. In fact, the Shaykh mentions it specifically after that. The false testification. Lying and testifying on behalf of somebody, it's not this person, it's not that person, he didn't do this, he didn't do that, he was with me at the time. And everybody knows and he knows he's guilty of having done that. So you lie to defend an individual in this way. وَأَعْظَمُ ذَلِكَ And the greatest of the evil, no doubt, is الشِّرْكُ بِاللَّهِ To commit shirk. So a person could use his tongue to commit shirk by making dua to others besides Allah or seeking aid and assistance from others besides Allah or other types of false speech which would constitute, constitute shirk. قَوْلُهُ أَوْ لِيَسْمُتْ So when the Prophet ﷺ said, so let him be silent. If you have nothing good to say, then be silent. Because when a person is silent, the shaykh says, that you find comfort within it. You find comfort and salvation within silence. فَإِذَا تَكَلَّمْتَ بِالْكَلَامِ السَّيِّئِ لَمْ تَتَمَكَّنْ مِنْ تَدَارُكِهِ وَرَدِّهِ If you end up saying something bad and evil, then it's gone, it's been said. Even if you say afterwards, I take it back, that speech has now been uttered from your mouth. So you better to stay silent rather than to say things, and then end up falling into evil or into useless speech. فُضُولِ الْكَلَامِ Wasteful, useless speech that has no benefit. And that is another problem. That the people, they sit together, and perhaps they talk about a topic or a discussion for an hour or two hours or three hours, and none of it is of any benefit. There is no use behind that topic or that discussion. It is not regarding the religion of Allah, not the Qur'an, not the Sunnah. Perhaps they sit there for hours and hours and hours talking about some topic which is of no benefit to the religion, no remembrance of Allah or the Messenger. So that is the useless and wasteful speech, which is also not correct to engage in. So that the Prophet ﷺ said, look towards your speech therefore, or the meaning of this now, to look towards your speech. If you have goodness to say, then speak. If you do not, and it's going to be some evil or corruption, then control yourselves and restrict your tongues. And that is why the scholars, they say, the tongue, you have been given two barriers. The tongue is imprisoned between two barriers or behind two barriers. The teeth and the lips. In order for you to exit your tongue, to bring your tongue out and speak, you have to open your teeth and then you have to open your lips. The teeth and the lips both have to be opened for the tongue to come out and speak. The scholars, they say, you've been given these two barriers, two cages in front of the tongue. Use them. Don't allow them to open loosely for your tongue to come out and backbite and speak about the people. So, there's a protection there for the tongue. ثُمَّ قَالَ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَمَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلَا يُؤْذِي جَارَةً That whomsoever believes in Allah on the last day, then let him not, let him not harm his neighbor. Let him not harm his neighbor. And this is mentioned in the Qur'an. وَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَشِفْ اللَّهَ Do not commit any shirk. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And be good to your parents. وَبِذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى And to the close ones, the relatives and the orphans. وَالْمَسَاكِينَ And those in poverty. وَالْجَارِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى And the neighbor from your relatives. وَالْجَارِ الْجُنُبِ 
and the neighbor that is uh, from your neighbors next door, from the close people by. So this ayah talks about the neighbors and the rights of the neighbors. ثُمَّ إِنَّ جَارَكَ تَمَنَكَ وَجَاوَرَكَ And because your neighbors, they will entrust you. There will be a level of trust between yourself and your neighbors. فَلَا يَصْدُرُوا مِنْكَ فِي حَقِّهِ أَذَا لَا بِالْقَوْلِ وَلَا بِالْفِعْلِ So therefore it is not befitting that you amongst your neighbors, you perform something which is incorrect or speak in a way which is incorrect or you betray that trust which exists between the neighbors. أَمَّا الْكَلِمَةَ الطَّيِّبَةَ As for goodness to your neighbors, then that will have an impact upon them. Goodness to your neighbors will have an impact upon them. Even if it is not wealth, it's not necessity you have to give somebody money or wealth to get goodness between and love between the people. Actions of goodness and actions are speech of goodness. You say something nice to the neighbors, etc. This puts goodness into the hearts of the people. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, فَالْيُكْرِمْ جَارَةً that whomsoever believes in Allah on the last day, then let him honor his guest. And the scholars, they mention that the rights of the neighbors, they differ. So for example, if your neighbor was somebody from your relatives, and he was Muslim, then they have a very high right upon you, for being your neighbor, and for being a Muslim, and for being your relative. Or if a person was a Muslim, and your neighbor, not your relative, still he has a high right upon you. He is your neighbor and he's a Muslim. Or maybe a person is your neighbor and not Muslim. Still, he has some rights. He has some rights of that neighborhood, of that uh, neighboring state. That if he's uh, your neighbor, even if he's a disbeliever, that you living there next door or a few doors in that area, you behave in a good way, you portray and present Islam in a good way to them, you behave in a good manner in your property and how you deal with things, so that they get a good impression of that. Not that you behave in an ill manner towards your neighbors and you distract your neighbors and disturb your neighbors even if they are not Muslims, that is not befitting as your neighbors then they have that right for you to behave in a good manner towards them as your neighbors and the Prophet mentioned the hadith where Jibreel would come to him and he would mention to him the rights of the neighbors so the Prophet said whomsoever believes in Allah on the last day then let him honor his guest And the guest is somebody, that's the third part now, the guest. The middle section was regarding the neighbors. The third section now, whomsoever believes in Allah on the last day, then let him honor his guest. And the guest is somebody who comes to you uh, and he uh, uh, settles in your house for a momentary time, whatever that amount of time may be, he comes to you as a guest. And so you honor this guest. You honor the guest in making him comfortable, in providing for him what he requires, in giving him that ease and facilitation whilst he is resident with you for that time period that he is with you. Uh, If he was in poverty or poor, then you provide some food for him also, and you give him what he requires to be comfortable and relaxed whilst he is in your home. That is from the honoring of the guest. And you do not harm him whilst he comes, and you do not wrong him, and you do not fall short with regards to his rights as he comes to you in your home. وجاء في الحديث أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال في الضيف uh, The Prophet ﷺ said regarding the neighbor, uh, the uh, guest جائزته يوم وليلة والضيافة ثلاثة أيام فما بعد ذلك فهو صدق وتمام الضيافة ثلاثة أيام وبلياليها It's mentioned that the time period for the guest for you to look after him etc. There's narrations about it that they uh, stay with you if it's a day or a night or up to three days. Then you look after the guest and you uh, give them their rights. And even if it was beyond that, then if the guest is with you, then you look after them and give them their rights. The scholars, they say, Al-wajibu yawmun wa layla, that it's obligatory, that if the guest comes and he wants to stay the day and the night, that you try to provide that for them. Try to provide that for them if they require that. And if you're able to help them further than that, they need to stay for more to two or three days. And if a person was to do that, this would be from the characteristics of Iman in looking after that guest who has come to you. So this is a hadith that explains some of the characteristics of Iman. And those characteristics are three things that are mentioned here. The first of those is that a person either speaks goodness with his tongue, or if he is unable and he does not have any goodness to say, then to remain silent. To protect himself from falling into evil with his tongue. Secondly, with regards to the neighbors... 
that whomsoever believes in Allah on the last day, then let him be good towards his neighbors. To give the rights to the neighbors and to behave in the proper and correct manner towards them. Not to disturb them and to distract them and to be evil towards them. And thirdly, that whomsoever believes in Allah on the last day, then for him to honor his guests. Those individuals who come to his home, then to honor those people and to honor his guests in his home or wherever that place may be. That is also from the characteristics of Iman. So these are three different items that have been mentioned in this hadith. Amongst many other characteristics that are from the characteristics of Iman. So that is the advice of the Prophet ﷺ and the characteristics of Iman that are mentioned in this particular narration. The next hadith that will start next time, next Sunday, is the hadith of Abu Huraira. Where the Prophet ﷺ advised with regards to not becoming angry. Anger, then this is an issue that the people they face. So the Prophet ﷺ, he advised regarding this emotion of anger. And not to become angry. So we'll see this hadith next week. We'll have a look at this hadith next week, what the Prophet ﷺ said. And how he advised this person who came to him and asked for this advice. So insha'Allah ta'ala that will be next week on Sunday. Uh, just to mention also that next week on Saturday, there's actually going to be two lessons next weekend. This one as normal on Sunday at 7.30 p.m. But then on Saturday as well, Saturday the 16th of November, in this same center, but downstairs in the main hall, there's going to be a mini conference with two lectures. Abu Iyad, he will come and do one. And we will do the other one, the evils of magic. That is the topic of the conference, the evils of magic. So that will be two lectures next Saturday, this Saturday coming, Saturday the 16th of November, starting from 5.30 p.m. Downstairs in the main hall from 5.30 p.m. on Saturday. Abu Ayyad, he will be here also, the evils of magic. And then on Sunday, 7.30, back to usual with this one. Also we'll mention the weekend after that, on the Saturday, Saturday the 23rd of November, which is basically two weeks away now, Saturday 23rd of November there will be a full one day conference in Bolton. There is a Salafi Masjid in Bolton, there will be a full one day conference in Bolton on Saturday the 23rd of November starting from 1 p.m., uh, and that will be four or five lectures, Abu Hakim, Abu Khadija. Uh, Abu Iyad, Abu Idris possibly There will be 4 or 5 lectures on that day In Bolton, the masjid Starting from 1pm on Saturday the 23rd In 2 weeks time So that's the schedule for the next couple of weeks So you should try to attend as much as possible Bring your family and your friends Let them benefit from it You should bring your families You should bring your children It is suitable for them to come You should not think that the children 8 or 9 or 10 or 11 years old They should be left at home It's suitable for them to come to these lessons for them to listen to these things, to listen to these ahadith and listen to these ayat. It's suitable for them to come and to learn. The salaf, they used to take their children at a young age. They mention about one of the salaf, or from the scholars of that time, one of them he used to have a rule. He used to say that anybody who hasn't got a beard can't come to my lesson. He meant the small kids. The small kids obviously don't have beards. So he used to say anybody who hasn't got a beard can't come to my lesson, i.e. the little kids. So it's mentioned that one of the scholars took his child, who was young at that time, 9, 10 years old, they had no beard. So the scholar who was teaching, he said, no, what's going on? We have the rule, you can't bring anybody without a beard. These small kids can't come. So the, uh, the other scholar who had brought his child, he said, my child, test him, test him. So when they tested him, the child had memorized more than all the other men in the circle as well. So then they allowed him to sit. But this is good to bring the children. And this is what the Salaf they used to do. Bring your children, teach them not to mess around, to sit and to listen. And they benefit from this. And this is the way you should nurture them and bring them up. So you should bring your families to these events and to these gatherings to benefit and to learn also. So we'll conclude upon that point.